Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 187 for March 15th, 2013. What's coming next in automotive interiors? Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Jen, how are you? It's good to be back with you, man. Yeah, good to be back here. And we got to say hello to this character, too, Drew Winter hey, from Ward's Auto World. Good to be here. Hey, good Peter. On the show. So, Peter, you got to explain. We've got this uh, big picture that you had uh, Chip Brake bring to the studio. And explain what this is so uh, the audience understands the new addition to the studio decor. Yeah, that's uh, A.J. Foyt's Indy car at Indy in 1966. Um, powered by Ford, and at that point he started to call his modified mid-engine chassis Coyotes. So this is the first Coyote? I think so. Um, not, Yeah, I think it is. This was the race that AJ got knocked out early on, and Graham Hill went on to win as a rookie, stunned that he won, and also Jimmy Clark finished second after spinning twice during the race, not hitting anything and going keeping going but uh, that's in the pit lane uh, this is from the website fordimages.com and I, I warn our viewers if they go or listeners be careful because you'll want to you, get you'll lose the whole day just going through all yeah, the pictures you, you'll right? want to get something and this happens to be a stretch canvas close up of AJ's car um, now it's number two. I thought AJ's race cars were always no, uh, number fourteen. No, uh, that clearly year, not. Yeah, that year for some reason it was number two. I'm not sure uh, why. Had he raced number fourteen before that? Do you know? You know, um, I don't think so. I don't. Th I think fourteen was on his winning car in '67, and then from that point on, yeah. what, no matter what he drove, right. just about not just Indy cars, yeah, it was that, always fourteen. And Tony Stewart, you know, called AJ when he was going and to do his NASCAR team, and said, "I'm going to take fourteen in honor of you." And AJ said, "That's that's awesome." That, you know? that that's a good story. I, I I figured there was some connection between the two because it is a famous race number. Well, people States. have suggested that Tony Stewart is the closest thing to to AJ. Uh, a modern day AJ. I would agree. In his diversity, uh, able to win anywhere on any track. Mm -hmm. The Coyote, what's the significance of that? I'm just. You know, I, I, AJ's car builder, uh, they came up with that name. I'm not quite sure about that. Because the, the I'm just thinking there's a Coyote and a Ford Coyote engine now, right? Well, that Ford Coyote engine, that remember at one point, AJ took the building of the Ford. IndyCar Motors, he took over uh, building those, and then he called them Foyt Coyotes or Ford Coyotes for a while, but, you know. Hey, later on in the show, we'll have uh, Klaus Busse, uh, the head of interior design at the Chrysler Group, coming on, but there was another designer in the news, uh, Henrik Fisker, quitting his own company. What do you guys make of that? Oh, uh, I'm. Uh, I, I was sorry to see it, but my I, the only thing I can think of is that they're they're negotiating with what a, a Chinese automaker to buy them. I've got to think that they're looking at more proletariat type cars. I mean, the original Fisker model was sort of very much like Tesla, where you have this high end, uh, uh, you know, high end car, and then you have another car coming in around fifty thousand dollars. It's luxurious, and then you have another one down below that that's still luxurious and I've got to believe that they're saying well the market for that's too limited the engineering costs and everything let's go to something that's more simpler more uh, along the lines of a you know a Chevy Volt or whatever who Tony Pazowitz who's running the place now I've got to think that's in order to 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 keep the company viable right. that's what they're looking at and Fisker um, 
I would speculate is, is Fisker just said, I don't want a car like that with my name on it. That's not what I got into the car business for. Well, I think Henrik went down the wrong road. I think he got caught up in his ego and, you know, he's a talented designer, but, you know, I think. He well, I think the, the mistake is, you know, to break into the car industry is damn near impossible. So if you're coming in, you better come in with something nobody has, either totally new car technology, and he doesn't. I mean, it's an extended range electric vehicle, a la Volt, and that's, yeah. to your point, Drew, kind of interesting. Tony Poswitz, who had run the Volt program pretty much, is, is now running Fisker. Or you better come in with some new process breakthrough, like Toyota did with the Toyota production system that nobody else has. You, if you're just going to try to do it on styling, lots of luck because you're up against the best design studios in the world. And uh, I, I felt that the car was doomed from the start just from that reason alone. Oh, yeah, and the footprint of the car, it's a big car, massive mm -hmm. car, heavy car. And it's just, still beautiful, though, and it's unique. I mean, the design is, I think, very... Yeah, uh, but, you know, uh, <laughs> hot designs are almost a dime a dozen these days. I think Henrik just got lost. He just got lost in the hay. Well, they had a lot of bad luck. Too. Yeah, he lost. He lost the government funding too. I mean, that's what uh, Tesla benefited from hitting its targets and getting five hundred million or whatever. And Fisker had a chance at that and, and didn't, uh, uh, but didn't hit its deadlines. And, and uh, uh, so that certainly hurt. And uh, yeah, but I, he got lost in the haze of his own ego. Let's face well, it. Well. My theory, it's, you know, the biggest faults of male egos are you buy a sports team or you try to start a car company. And, you know, at, usually neither one turns out all that well. Um, but, uh, you know, DeLorean had a brilliant idea of having cars that you don't paint. I mean, the most expensive part of, of making any vehicle is painting the exterior. He came out with this great idea is we're not going to paint it. We're going to make it stainless steel. But... Again, yeah, ego and everything else caught up with him and lack of money. Yeah, uh, another uh, development that we just saw, Peter, and this is right up your alley, General Motors undoing everything that Joe Alawanek had done at General Motors from an advertising standpoint. Yeah, uh, you know, they've been on a jihad to do that. And, um, you know, uh, so now they're the Commonwealth, this agency that was formed with Goodby and McCann as equal partners uh, to do Chevrolet. Now uh, McCann is going to do all of it. And Chevrolet is, I mean, Goodby is going to retain some some dealer group business and things like that. And McCann was already controlling Chevrolet globally, but just not here in the U.S. Now they're getting it all. And... Um, you know, I, I put this on the site. GM has overreacted over Joel. You know, they've said, oh, well, we're going to go the opposite direction. We don't need a CMO, especially a rock star CMO, whatever. We don't need one. Well, they do need one. They need a marketing leader. And Alan Beatty is a sales guy from Australia that Mark Royce brought because Mark worked with them. Good guy and all that, but he's he's not a chief marketing officer. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the longer they don't do that, guess who the functioning chief marketing officer is? Captain Queeg. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Ackerson. Yeah. Just to translate for those yeah. who haven't caught on. So, you know, I, I think this unwinding of anything Joel touched is just, you know, they're just doing it. Just and, do it. and what do you make of uh, all the Cadillac business going to, to Campbell, Campbell Ewald, Ewald, which just left its long, long, long time headquarters in Warren, Michigan, and moved into downtown Detroit? Well, this has been in the works. I mean, the moment Chevrolet was yanked from Campbell Ewald, Michael Ross, who heads the Interpublic Group of Companies, which is the holding company for Campbell Ewald, all of a sudden was acting like a junior account guy and coming to Detroit every month and talking. And uh, that move, by the way, is going to happen at the end of this year. Uh, but I think that is the result of Michael Roth lobbying General Motors upper management to get Cadillac. Uh, Fallon never really worked. You know, that was Joel had two, two friends in the business, uh, Pat Fallon and Jeff Goodby. He worked with them before, and they did great work together. Um, the assumption that that was going to happen again might have been a mistake. Um, 
But the ironic thing about Cadillac being yanked is the most recent Cadillac campaign, the ATS campaign, was very well received and I thought was very well executed. I, I would agree with that. And In fact, uh, you know, Cadillac sales the first two months of the year are up yeah. almost 30 yeah. percent, largely on the ATS right. and the XTS. Because yeah, there was because there was a lot of skepticism that there was uh, the CTS. Pricing, uh, they, they were pricing CTSs to move, and people were going to ignore the ATS to get a better deal on the bigger CTS. And then I was, I, I was happy for him to see that the ATS was getting its its just recognition, um, and and doing doing real well. And the XTS too, it's fantastic interior in that car. XTS yeah, is, is nice. Yeah, so anyway, I, you know, Fallon took a long time to get up to speed and there were a lot of problems and but uh, Fallon did that series of ads for the ATS did they yes so but you know I tried to explain and on the table on the site this is a political thing IPG wants to get as much GM business as possible and so what does IPG own well they own McCann and they own Campbell Ewald now there's some rumors that Publicis which has Buick GMC and Chevy Silverado, which was pulled out of uh, Goodby right at the end of the year, you know, there's talk that, uh, you know, IPG is going to buy Publicis or something so that, you know, IPG want, and GM are, you know, they want this link. So there's so much behind the scenes stuff that goes be goes on with these moves that people just don't. Mm -hmm. well, well, you spent a lot of years in, in advertising. I mean, is it, are you a Mad Men fan? I mean, is it as much a snake pit as, as Mad Men? Oh, it's just, it was much worse than the real world. <laughs> I mean, Mad Men's interesting and all that and kind of fun. I love the era and the clothes and stuff, but the real ad world is... Far I mean, more vicious than a TV <laughs> show, huh? Vicious and, and wild, too. <laughs> Of course, it's all calmed down now. Now it's all politically correct and group hugs and, oh, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. But uh, nobody loses a leg to a lawnmower in the office. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, big guy, you know, we were talking about this uh, picture of the A.J. Foy IndyCar that you brought in. Other big news, ALMS and uh, the Rolex series, yeah. officially together with a new name and logo. Yeah, they officially unveiled that today. They start racing in 2014. It's... Uh, the United uh, Sports Car Racing Series, and I joked on Twitter, at least they didn't call it the United Sports Car Racing Collective, but uh, it's, you know, it's kind of a benign name, and they've got a new logo, and um, everyone was waiting for this, you know, big announcement of the name, like there was going to be something to it, and it's, it's pretty boring, you know. Fortunately, the emphasis should be on the product they put on the track, so... And uh, I see uh, Bridgestone signed up to uh, be on the Delta Wing car with Panos. Huh? Yeah, that was interesting because, you know, Michelin uh, really invests a lot in development and racing. And I think Michelin pay, played a key role in the success of the Delta Wing early on in the development and bringing it all together. So it'll be interesting. You know, you just don't bolt new tires on a car and it, it works so uh, but a lot most of the key players are not involved with delta wing anymore so it's, it's kind right. of running in limbo i'm going to be uh moderating a panel discussion at the sae congress next month all on does motor racing still hold any relevance for production series cars and uh Ben Boldy is going to be on the oh, panel, good. so I, I I can't wait to hear what he's got to say as to you know what the hell's going on with Delta Wing, at least from his standpoint, because he seems to be out of it now. Yeah, I'm going down to Sebring tomorrow. So oh, really? Yeah, we'll see it run again, and along with the last visit of the Audi turbo diesels, apparently, because huh. the Unified Series they're not going to run. Not going to be here. allowed, huh? No, they're just not going to run over here, I guess. Hmm. Drew, did you follow that uh, Audi news that they're introducing so many more diesels, too? Yeah. In the U.S. market? Yeah. Because obviously elsewhere, that's not news. Yeah. Well, what lots of people are doing it now. I mean, we're seeing it, uh, you know, Mercedes has more. We've got certainly uh, Chrysler is, is, is uh, uh, light-duty diesels going into the Ram, um, as well as a Grand Cherokee. And, Wrangler, too, didn't they? Yeah, well, there's, I don't know. We can, we may have to, I don't know if they're confirming that yet or not, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's what we're seeing that, you know, certainly Chrysler with 
more of its European heritage. They're, they're pushing diesels more, but uh, we're wondering, uh, you know, GM and Ford had some really nice light duty diesels that were sitting on a shelf and then everybody chickened out when the economy got bad and, and diesel fuel prices went up here. Uh, but they've got a couple they could take off the shelf and throw on some pickups now, too. Drew, you remember that super engine that GM did right before the bankruptcy? Yeah. That won a, yeah. an international award. I mean, uh, it was quite the thing. And so they still have that on the shelf, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of good stuff out there. But uh, uh, the, the it looks like now, everybody, you know, at one time, Nissan was going to introduce a three-liter diesel and uh, there, there was a whole bunch of them, and everybody but the Europeans had chickened out. Now we'll see, uh, uh, you know, how many more are coming. And it's, it's going to be interesting to follow because it's just w with the Chevy Cruze and, and some of these others. The Mazda I, 6, right? Mazda 6. Are they going to get accepted? You know, um, uh, I, I don't know, but it's going to be fun. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, to me, this is the year of the diesel. This is the year, I should say, that we'll learn if diesels are really going to start to catch on in the U.S. market. Because that was supposed to be like 2008 before everybody canceled all their programs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when to your point, when you've got Chevrolet with a mainstream car like the Cruze, uh, Jeep with an iconic vehicle like the Grand Cherokee, Mazda coming in with a low compression diesel... I, I keep saying, if these things do even reasonably well, everyone's jumping into the pool. That's that's what I think. And to your point, these on-the-shelf diesels at Ford and, and General Motors will be dusted off and put into production fairly quick, I think. Well, that GM engine had the exhaust out the center of the, right. the V. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, the yeah. intakes on the sides the exhaust out, and I guess that was for packaging the turbo. Yeah, you had your turbo sitting in the V there, and a lot of people are doing that now. I and mean, it, uh, and yeah. it won all kinds of awards. I think it, I don't know if your publication singled out, but I remember that, and they've talked about the guys who worked on it, and it was a big deal. Yeah, the reverse flow and all that right, stuff. Right, but it never went into production. So, right. you know, they, they might have gotten an award for having a beautiful paper design, but, well, they know. had it in a car. They had no, it, they had they, it finished. They, they, they had it. Oh, people really? were driving it and stuff. Oh, no, and yeah. uh, it was it was ready to roll. And then they so. chickened out, as yeah. it <laughs> How about Peter Schwarzenbrauer leaving? Uh, well, he left Audi, and now he's going to BMW. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Because he did great stuff, and he got shuffled in the musical chairs thing at Audi, and now he's going to BMW. Well, you know, never a dull moment in yeah. this industry. Hey, uh, why don't we take a quick commercial break and let's get our guest, Klaus Busse, to come on the show. So, Ben, let's give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Klaus Busse, welcome to AutoLine After Hours. Thank you, John. Always fun to be here. Not only that, but you brought one of your toys with you. <laughs> yeah. There's Grand Cherokee in the studio. The and big toy, isn't it? Uh, the good old 2014 Grand Cherokee that we just in the progress of, of launching. Uh, quite a project we're very proud of. So you're in charge of all interior design. Have I been describing this right? Have I promoted you properly? <laughs> no, you have not promoted me. It's actually the job that I do indeed have. Um, and yeah, it's all brands, uh, Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, SRT even. So, yeah. But always the interiors. Always the interior. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Klaus, where'd you, where, tell us briefly your, about your career. If you can call it a career. Um, I, I grew up in Germany, as you can hear from the accent. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little giveaway in the name, too, right? Who knew? Yeah. But, uh, and, I, and, I, and I started, actually, the German company, Mercedes-Benz, back in the day. Uh, and then during the merger days, I came over what was supposed to be an exchange program for two or three years. Um, and then in 2008, when the companies decided to go different ways, um, I, I decided to, to stay here at Chrysler, you know, with the good guys. That's great. Little did you know that everything was about to go off a cliff, right? You know, uh, the clouds were uh, assembling on the horizon. It was summer of 2008 when I made the call, but um, it, uh, I, we didn't quite think it was that bad. Um, having said that, you know, the good thing is in design office, we work in the future. We see the crystal ball. So while even going through the bankruptcy, we were already working on, you know, the 300, the Charger, the Durango, the Grand Cherokee, all those products that would later become the foundation of the turnaround, those were already well underway. So it was a, a risk that, that was not too big. I mean, the parents of my wife back then thought I'm flat out stupid, but, uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be the right decision. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I've always seen this, particularly in Detroit, some of the best products come out when, when the automakers are really, their backs are against the wall. Sure, they get and, focused. And, and, yes. there, there's no nonsense. There's no BS. It's like, boom, this yeah. is going to work. Go for it. And, well, and generally, I think you can say uh, the, the worse the times, the, the more need is there for creative people because they, they need new ideas. So it was a good time for, for design office, as it is since. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So Drew, uh, uh, publication sponsors uh, an interior show, yes, right? Close. That's coming up soon, right, yeah, Drew? Yeah, May 22nd. They told me, yeah, make sure everybody knows. May 22nd, we're hoping to get some great designers like Klaus to come in and speak. And, and uh, um, we have, um, you know, a good lineup. We, uh, we have a uh, student design competition where we're working with uh, students at the uh, Center, uh, College for Creative Studies now. Um, and uh, with a, a great instructor from Ford working these young students um, to uh, come up with new, you know, really new ideas, fresh ideas for interiors. That's part of the program. We do our 10 best interiors where we're t in the middle of right now, we're, we're testing about 50 new cars to come up with uh, what we think are the 10 best interiors for the year. And then we have our, our overall conference where we, Every year we try to explore, you know, where interiors are going, uh, new materials, new concepts. Uh, we've got a, a, a conference, a session this, uh, this time where we're uh, looking at getting ideas from other industries, from the environment. You know, how does this whole design process uh, come about, and I know Klaus has, has talked about how he was inspired by different, for the, for the uh, Cherokee, um, different countries, different cities, landscapes, yeah. landscapes yeah. to, to get the inspiration. Fact, the, uh, the interior that we have in the vehicle here uh, is, is a brown interior, but it's inspired by the Grand Canyon. And because what we did is, you know, when you start these, these processes of coming up with new colors and materials, there's the temptation to look at what's happening in the fashion industry or anything that, that, men may, that men already created. But you put yourself in a bad position because you're looking at something that someone did a year ago to do something that you want to come out in three years, so you're four years behind the ball. Um, and, and Jeep is so iconic, we didn't want to follow trends, we want to set trends. And so we looked at areas that are truly timeless, which is nature. And there are a couple of really, really cool locations we looked at. And the Grand Canyon, of course, being an iconic American destination we looked at. And we look at the, the Grand Canyon, you will realize there's no chrome. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we took out the chrome and we replaced it with copper, which has this really nice warm tone. So now we have this brown leather wrapped instrument panel, the brown open pore wood, and now we complemented it, it with uh, with a copper and it gives this interior a really unique feel. And I was really excited to see when I walked the Detroit Auto Show or the Geneva Auto Show recently, there was no other car with a chrome trim that I could find. So we actually did come up with something that, that could maybe start a new trend. And so it, other than going to the Grand Canyon or the Ward's Interior Show, where do you go? What are you looking for? How, how do you come up with new ideas? Yeah, um, you, can't, you cannot pinpoint one thing. Um, we designers, not me, the, the, our, our, us as a breed, us in general, we walk through life with open ears, open, uh, open eyes. It could be a documentary we see on TV. It could be a good meal uh, in a different country. Uh, one, one thing uh, that, that always leaves an impression is like walking the Champs-Élysées in Paris in the middle of the night because you see, you see the beautiful architecture, beautiful people, beautiful food. It does not give me an idea for a certain color or a certain shape, but it just puts you into a creative state of mind. And you understand French cars also when you see this kind of environment. So it's really, you know, seeing beautiful things that inspire you to also create beautiful things versus I want to copy this shape. Because, yeah, we have a guy coming in. He's president of a medical devices company, but he speaks to automotive groups fairly, fairly regularly on, on how to use, you know, he's another industry, but, but he looks at the uh, anatomy and, 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 you know, he, he views uh, humans and the environment and how they work and creates devices that, that, you know, for new joints or whatever. But it's still the same sort of inspiration, looking at nature, looking at how things work and then adapting new designs. And um, he's, he's, he's got a fascinating way of looking at the world. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I, I was reading an article about video games, about, you know, there was a new video game came in, coming out and they decided to keep the controls exactly where the main seller kept the controls, because that's how people 
used to play certain video games. And even there, you, you, you think there's a certain piece of wisdom, because why should I recreate or mess with how people operate a car if there's a proven way? And, and a lot of time, journalists actually get frustrated with me, because when I admit I not necessarily read automotive publications, because I, I browse the internet. You know, I, you, today you have all these wonderful apps that put together your own newspaper, and, and there are topics like philosophy, healthy lifestyle, luxury lifestyle, and, and, and those apps crawl the internet and give you, you know, these interesting things. And that's where you know you find these nuggets of ideas where you think, wow, that's interesting. Let's try that, versus having it pre-digested uh, in, in a certain publication. One of the trends I've noticed in the last few years on the interiors of vehicles is a lot more attention being p played to ambient lighting, yeah. you know, where the door handles are backlit. There's pipes, light pipes running along, maybe even across the, the, the front of the instrument panel, down the sides of the car, creating a whole different look and feeling. Is, is that something that you guys are into? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, who does not remember at least one beautiful sunset at the beach? Okay, and it's all about the light. And when you do photography, you know when not to do the photo at 12 o'clock at, at noon, but to do it in the morning or in the evening when the light is perfect, the warm light, the cold light. Light is so magic in our life. And, and to put it into the car in the right context, I'm not a fan of putting it right on top of the instrument panel where it reflects, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all about safe driving. But life can create a, a beautiful atmosphere, a beautiful emo emotional context that, yes, of course, uh, there's a right place in the interior of a car, too. Yeah, and, and the progress they're making is incredible. I mean, this, like the new Cadillac XTS has, there, you know, before you used to have the kind of light pipes and stuff, but now it looks like, I'm not exactly sure what they did. It looks like they put LEDs like underneath like uh, some of the trim, but then there's a gap there where the, where the, the light just kind of glows. It's indirect out. lighting. Yeah, it's yes. indirect lighting, and then it reflects off the, the shapes of the door and everything, and it's real subtle, and it looks kind of modern, and, and, and ah, it's just- It's uh, very inviting. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, it's a beautiful effect. And then, uh, well, it, it, our, at our conference, we've got uh, a lighting supplier talks about the psychographics of light, where, you know, they say, well, like, um, the older you get, you start to like like minty green colors, and then when you're younger, it's red and what all this stuff. And it's 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 wild what they're doing. But I think this has got to be what light is like a huge huge new design element. Well, uh, light. Uh, I think we're 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 breaking the code on light. Um, but if you want to talk about frontiers, I think the frontier for us is connectivity. You know, it's it's getting all these technologies in the car. And at the same time, providing a saving uh, driving environment, not only for you, but the people around you and the traffic. So light, absolutely. But uh, in terms of what keeps me up at night is, is certainly the connectivity, the safe driving. So speaking of connectivity, the Uconnect system yeah. has won all kinds of awards. It's a very well done system. Did you play a role in the look of the screen on that? Yeah, so interior design, my responsibility does contain, apart from the shapes and the, and the colors and materials, it does also contain uh, the graphics and the screen. And now in the cluster, the, now that we started using, you know, big seven-inch displays in the cluster. So my team uh, is responsible for the graphics. Um, the, the, the stuff that makes it happen in the background, the network, we have a fantastic team of engineers uh, under Mauro Zinos taking care of that. But uh, the stuff that you see, uh, we're working with HMI to create an overall user experience with an interior design. Well, I do like the graphics. I like the fonts, the colors, the yeah. shapes. Yeah. I, it's very well You know, done. it's one of these things where I think we, we learned uh, you don't want to be the first uh, with, with crazy stuff in that area. You want to do something that people are comfortable with. And I think you mentioned the awards we've, we've won recently with that system. It, it put us in a good place, and we're happy to be there. Do you have like nightmares at night thinking about autonomous cars? I mean, everybody's talking about them now. Does that, is that just, is that gonna totally change the interior or? Uh, I, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait uh, because there will always be the time where, yes, um, you know, I, I, I drive an SRT8. I, I love driving a car. I love taking it to the racetrack or, you know, within the legal rules of, of our system. Do, or not. Uh, or not. <laughs> well, uh, and on the road. But, um, you know, I, I went to Germany not too long ago and it came, you know, you take the overnight flight, you, you get there in the morning totally tired. And I wanted to, um, you know, visit my, my aunt for her birthday. And I thought, okay, do I take the Challenger SRT8 from the Stuttgart office, which we had back then, or, and I ended up just taking the train. Nice seat, you can do your Wi-Fi thing, you can do your emails, you can take a nap. So autonomous driving, 
not to get your adrenaline going or things out of the system, but getting safely from A to B, doing some work on this side, having a conversation, and get there with a nice, quiet pulse and the energy then to party. Uh, I think there's, there's tons of opportunity, especially in this country with those vast distances that we have. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the Grand Cherokee, since we have one yeah. studio here. You know, what I've been uh, so interested about this vehicle on is that it's only two and a half years, I think, into its cycle. Yeah. It went through a refresh. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the things that you did on the interior and, yeah. and what led you to do that. Well, you, you mentioned a very important point. Um, you could say there was no need to do it. We, we're, we're, we're selling, you know, the actual, the leather wrapped instrument panel, how quickly we can produce them is what's, what's dictating sales. We, 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 we sell them. So you might, one might wonder why, why going through the expenses, but I think it speaks to who we are now as a company. It speaks to the fact that we don't rest on our laurels anymore. We will not be the generation that, that will let this company slide again. So we want to build on the success and get better and get better. So we already had, thanks to uh, Drew and his colleagues, an award-winning interior. And we have an award-winning Uconnect system. So it was natural to combine the two things. So we put the 8.4-inch Connect system into this vehicle. We also enhance it with what we now have um, in the company, the 7-inch uh, display in the cluster, plus the analog on the side. Uh, which is a fantastic uh, opportunity for us to safely communicate with uh, with the driver and and allow a safe driving environment, and then enhance you know the, this color and trim story that we talked about these Grand Canyon inspired packages. We have the, now the Dynamica headliner, which is which is the same product as Alcantara. It has some has better stretchability, so we could use it with the sunroof headliner, but it's basically like Alcantara and other things. And then of course it has the eight speed transmission now, so it needed the electronic shifter, right? So um, we we took a product that sells fantastic, made it even better so it'll stand the test of time. One thing too that I'm seeing in a lot of cars these days is a lot more attention being paid to the seams on mm -hmm. seats. Everything's going with French seams yeah, these days, yeah. or almost what I'd call double or triple French seams. Yes. What, what, what's the thinking behind the industry moving that way? It's, it's all about detail. Um, you know, um, look at fashion, right? If you, you know, you can, it, it's, it's all in the details. It's, uh, you know, when you look at certain brands, I don't want to name them uh, and turn this into a commercial here, but there are certain really cool brands out there that really um, excel on details. And it's the same on the interior. It just shows that you care, whether it is, you know, the little Easter eggs that we do in our cars, right? When we when we molded in the Laguna Seca racetrack on the Viper bin, right? Because we hold, um, well, we held the, 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 the lap record and we might hold it again. We'll see. Or the Nürburgring, right? We do these little Easter eggs. And the same thing is with, with seams. It's just the additional extra detail. And it allows you to bring in a color or two, which is not overwhelming. You know, the, 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 the sister ship of, of the Grand Canyon is the Vesuvius package. And where we use really nice, rich, dark blues, dark browns. But then we have this surprise, really white piping on the seat. If you would do too much white, it'll be too much, but it'll allow us to just bring in a touch of color, you know, just like the icing on the cake. And, and plus the technology to create that stitching and whatnot, is, it's, it's less expensive now, right? So well, it, you, because it's cut and sew, you need, you need some kind of stitch anyway to hold the thing okay. together. So you pretty much, cost-wise, you're already there. But now it allows us to really, rather than doing a tone-on-tone stitching even, you can, you can play with some accents and throw in a few surprises. Even on the journey, we had like a, a pearl, a pretty, almost white-colored seat, and we had orange uh, stitching. And that was something really fresh that, that did very well on the, on the West Coast. So is that what we'll get uh, in terms of a dash of color in the interior? Because one of the biggest complaints I always hear is, geez, we get a black, a beige, or yeah. a gray interior. That's it. So is that another reason why we're seeing some of these off-color uh, maybe that's not the right way to say it. <laughs> Different color uh, yeah. stitching and, and the like to add more detail and color to the interior. So just look at a, at a, at a good meal, right? Um, there are sir, always the same ingredients that make a good meal. What, what, the, the, what the chef will do, it'll, it'll slightly change some of the spices. So look at those details as the spice. We will not do an orange instrument panel or a pink instrument panel, but we can do an orange, orange accent stitch, get away with it, and actually show that care for detail. So it's, it's you know, the stronger the color, the more careful you have to use it, just like spices. So of your competitors who who have done some interiors that you like? 
You know what um, the, the French, what the French are doing, um, how they come back with um, this this French uh, avant-garde kind of style. You know, some of the Citroen interiors that they, um, you know I'm I'm, I'm impressed with. Um, they they seem to master quality with what we all think of French uh, cars. Some of the avant-garde design. Um, for some reason, you know, they, they, the pricing of the cars seem to bite them now, so they're, they're, they struggle. But there, there's, some, there's some really uh, cool product out there. Um, here stateside, you know, whether you believe it or not, I'm, I think for, for uh, the value proposition that we have, the segments we're playing it, I take our product over anyone any day. Do you see with, with the economy now slowly approving, improving, um, does that influence the, the color choices and things like that? I mean, it seems like, you know, in, in the 50s or in, in, in times when, when the economy's going good, you see these uh, uh, brightly contrasting colors and very flamboyant interiors. And then when the economy gets bad, everything gets more conservative. That, that is you, a very interesting question. And, and to be honest, I never thought about that. Oh, okay. But I, I, I better start paying attention, although I don't hope we're going to get another recession in my yeah, lifetime. Right. Yeah. But no, I, 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 uh, frankly, um, uh, we, 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 our decisions were not led by that, by that thought, by that motivation. But it's an interesting one. I got to, I got to take a look at that. Where do you think uh, trim in the interior is going? Woods, you know, carbon fibers yeah. catching on a whole lot more. Uh, even just interesting moldings in plastic. There's some yeah. interesting things going on. So you, you, you say an important thing, plastic, right? Plastic has this annotation of being something really, really bad, especially when it comes to car interiors. I think plastic's downfall is the name. Mm -hmm. If you look at Alcantara, Alcantara is, is, is faux suede. It's, it's an artificial material, but it has this wonderful name, okay? And but there's different types of Alcantara. Well, there there's is. some that look like dish rags. Yes, and there's <laughs> and different others kind that of are very plastic. fine. There's yeah. different kind of plastics. But, you know, in Germany, we actually have two names for plastic. One is plastic, and that's what we categorize the cheap stuff. And one is Kunststoff, which means artificial material, which usually is the high-end plastic. Um, and, and I'm, you know, when I meet with the suppliers, I said, don't show me the, the cool stuff. Give me, give it where's the cool marketing name that comes with it? Because quite frankly, if you look at uh, consumer electronics, uh, there's nothing wrong with plastic, okay? The high gloss white plastics that, that, that uh, certain companies use for cell phones, etc. Plastic can be used really, really cool. Um, just not animal grain and, and gray and flat like, you know, some interiors that slipped out in the past. Mm -hmm. So what you seem to be saying is we'll see more interesting uses of plastic? So... I, I'm not, I can't really make you any promises, not because I don't want to talk about future product, which of course I would not anyway, but, but more it is, it is, um, it is an interesting um, time where we at, led by the consumer electronics. Again, um, if you look at, you know, cell phone cases, iPhone cases, for example, right, you can buy all kinds of finishes, rarely real wood, you'll get fake wood. And so there's a generation growing up thinking, yeah, it's kind of cool to imitate wood and better than, you know, cutting down that poor tree, okay? At the same time, we, we find ourselves now with, as we get more adventurous with, with our colors, literally, as we go around the planet, adventurous with our colors, we find that the wood grain is actually not taking us where we want to go. We would like to see a certain color in there. And you can't get that unless you, find, you know, chop down the last tree of that kind in, in, in Southern uh, America. We will never do that. So we start engineering these wood grains and truly create an engineered, man-made appearance. Uh, and at that point, uh, I think we're, we're, we're crossing that line where there's the need for real wood, but something that is, uh, you know, man-made and gives you much more opportunity. Well, you and you really broke the ground in the U.S. with the open pore wood yeah. on the on the uh, uh, 300 luxury yes. last year. Which, What's the open pore wood? It's it's a, a matte. Well, you can explain. <laughs> well, uh, basically, um, you know, wood in a natural phase is open pore wood. It's rough, right? You see the pores. But uh, what in the past has been done is you clear lacquer that thing and seal it um, for all kinds of reasons. Now technology is advanced enough that you can still seal it very thinly, but you maintain the open pore, the real wood authentic feel. Um, at one point, you could say we were pushing it for a while, and 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 there were voices that felt, is the customer ready? Because we trained the customer to look at wood as being high gloss, okay? And now suddenly you take the gloss away, and people might think, is that is that still wood? Of course it's wood. So there's there's a story that needs to be told uh, alongside. <laughs> but yeah, we we now also in the Grand Cherokee, 
uh, we're pushing for open pour wood as it gives you the more natural feel. As, and it fits, you know, a, a brand like Grand Cherokee, which still depends on authentic materials like real leather and real wood. And then we're seeing um, a lot with the lighter color, the blonde colored woods, and then the matte finishes on these. Um, so more, we can kind of run your finger over them. It f feels much more natural. And then even on the Longhorn Edition mm -hmm. that you got, they actually, for trim, you have what, what, what it's fence posts or something, actual fence posts or... or well, uh, on, on, uh, on, the, on the Longhorn, we have a couple of really unique things, especially in the truck segment. Of course, the open pole wood that you're, that yeah. you're mentioning, uh, real metal that has uh, engraving that is inspired like from, from like a beautiful rifle, an artisan rifle. So there's, and then, and then we have on the seats, we have uh, the laser etching, you know, inspired by, you know, um, you know, let's say cowboy boots, for example. So you, uh, authentic materials in an off use in an authentic way. And I mean, you know, you've got, Pickup trucks now that are being, you know, handcrafted like Aston Martins practically. It's, it's yes. just, it's yeah. crazy the stuff that's going on. Well, you, all you have, you know, for me it was really eye opening to take a trip down there and, and meeting one of these uh, of these uh, gentlemen down there with this big ranch and um, his his daughter was in the in the bull riding competition and and they showed me the rig like there's this trailer which is you know a couple of hundred thousand dollars the, the horses are super expensive, so they're pulling like half a million worth of gear and I thought wow you know that deserves deserves a special vehicle to pull it. Yeah. And those people would never buy a car from southern Germany. They yeah. they they want a pickup truck, but they still want to have this these amenities, the luxury, what they have in their living room. And when you see the living rooms, oh my god. Yeah. So why not give them that kind of atmosphere on a truck and I think that's what we did. Behold, the $65,000 pickup truck is what it, Yeah. It's crazy. Hey. A lot of profit in those trucks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, let's get to the questions from our viewers right now. Ben, it's time for rapid fire. Let it rip. Okay, uh, Klaus. Chuck Grenchy wants to know, has there ever been any thought on offering adjustable armrests and or center console height adjustments? Uh, yes, there has been, uh, but we, we settled the, with the fact that the seat is adjustable up and down, that that would, would solve that, that problem versus making both of them uh, adjustable. Mm -hmm. Will we see that center console adjustment? No, no, I think uh, you're not going to see that from us in the near future because uh, quite fr we, we believe that the, that the adjustability that we offer within the seat uh, should hopefully put you in that, in that uh, comfortable uh, seating position, including the armrests. Dr. Nick wants to know, when will we see OEM supply holders in the dash for phones or tablets to be plugged into the car infrastructure, allowing them to become the entertainment control center for the car? without a manufacturer supplied head unit. Yeah. Ah. So I was mentioning earlier that this is the big frontier that we're facing right now with connectivity and, and believe me we won't be the only one uh, looking at opportunities like that. What uh, everyone has to ask themselves is do I always want to carry that device with me? Do I always want to spend the extra effort and time to dock it for it to start and load before I can get going? How many times do we find ourselves running quick errands where you just want to quick get in, grab that bottle of milk, go back to the house without worrying, oh, did I bring my tablet to dock it? So there's a lot of advantages, but I see a lot of disadvantages too. So the future will say. Very interesting. VRM Chris says, is there going to be a greater use of natural materials in the interior? We already use excessive amounts of natural uh, materials, right? Uh, the leathers, the woods, uh, etc. If he's referring to, um, you know, um, natural in terms of replacing plastic, uh, I think plastic um, is going to stay in the interior in a good use in a, in, in a, for, a, for a long time. Um, but we use excessive amounts, not excessive, we use large amounts of natural materials, you know, in this vehicle here behind me with the leather and the wood, et cetera. And, and the, the uh, filler materials, what there, there used to be a lot of glass fiber and things in, in a lot of the interior panels and, and the plastics, and now they're using a lot more natural filler materials yeah. that are, are um, what are flax and, and yeah, some absolutely, of the, correct. Uh, right. to, so it's more natural and it makes it easier to recycle. Both. There's a lot of fiber, there's a lot of fiber be, 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 um, below the skin yeah. where, where you don't see it. Seats, uh, seats especially. Uh -huh. 
Swivel Buckets wants to know, how closely do you work with Ralph Gilles on these vehicles? Oh, he, he's my boss. My boss, <laughs> and, and, and I'm happy to say he's my friend, too. So we have a very good working relationship. And, uh, and just prior to coming to this show, I spent, uh, you know, how much time did we spend, Ralph? Three hours uh, reviewing programs. So we interact daily. Peter, I'm going to throw this to you because there was a second part to it. What about that four-cylinder Mustang reportedly coming? I think that's the way of the future. I okay. think absolutely that they can deliver a Mustang that has, what, 260 horsepower and base trim or something. Why, why not? Why not? Right. It's all about power and power density. It doesn't yeah. matter necessarily how many cylinders are right. there. Yeah. Except from a sound standpoint. Right, right. Yeah. I think they're, they're talking even more horsepower than that for that engine. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. Close I mean, to 300. Might, yeah. Yeah. Klaus, speaking of sound, do you get involved in the interior sounds of a vehicle? Um, we, we make sure that we get a canvas that uh, makes, gives us an uh, uh, enjoyable driving experience, which means the cabin is quiet to begin with. Okay? Uh, and I think we've done a fantastic job uh, with the 300, the Grand Cherokee, even the Ram. Where I do and my team actively go in, get involved is, is the sound of button clicks. And you'll see that going forward much more, you know, because the click subconsciously speaks quality or not, right? So we'll, we'll get, we, we are involved with that, even chimes. So, so everything that's part of the user experience, we, will, we are involved. Yeah. Now, how about a couple, like uh, uh, Acura and Honda are using sound cancellation to mute some, some vibration, and then you have uh, folks like Ford are actually using running a sound pipe from the uh, manifold, the engine manifold, to the interior to get a, a you know, to, to get some pleasant sound. Yeah. Do you work in, is, is that your area as well in interior design? No, it, it's not. It, that falls into overall vehicle engineering, um, where we use dual pane, um, you know, the, or thicker, uh, thicker glass, dual layer glass, um, and, and do certain, you know, natural materials, mm -hmm. use them for sound insulation from engine block to the to the compartment uh, and also underneath the floor. So, um, but that falls into the engineering department. Wright Knight's got a question that I should have asked you earlier in the show, so I'm glad Wright Knight did. Why not use a very thinly cut marble or stone as an interior treatment? So during my days at Mercedes, we, um, they um, had developed that. They tried it in the S-Class Coupe. The, um, it C had granite, right? Correct. Yeah, the, I the remember C that. The yeah, C it looked cool. It didn't take off. Mm -hmm. It didn't take off. That's that's all I can say. Uh, there's also what what um, people must not forget is there's there will occasionally be the the accident, the the head impact scenario, and to control thin layers of stone not flying through the cabin and, and cutting you uh, is 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 also uh, an issue. But Ma but Mercedes had had it in that car um, back in the day. Uh, it just didn't didn't take off. Wow, I remember it looked pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you bought that one car? Oh no, yeah, that was that was a little out of my. I range. first read about it in Warren. <laughs> yeah. Uh, AAH guest four ninety four is asking the question that we want to know: Is that Jeep Wrangler going to get the diesel? Uh, I work interior design. Uh -huh. so, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you think of the Lambo Veneno styling? <laughs> Well, uh, I usually do not comment on on, on competitor product, uh, good or bad. I did good with the, with the, with the French interiors, um, but I, uh, it's an interesting car. I think uh, Lamborghini has defined how far uh, you can push automotive design before you get ridiculous or even beyond. So, so do they step over the line, or? I, um, it's an extreme car. <laughs> Um, the, the, you see, we, we also launched the, the LaFerrari, right, which, which plays in the same league. I mean, uh, the LaFerrari being a car from 0 to 182 miles per hour in 15 seconds. I mean, how much more extreme can you get? And you look at that, and it's pure beauty, okay? It, I mean, I, I had the chance to look at it in, in person, and it's just such a beautiful thing. And then, you know, the beauty and the beast, right? There's, there's always, like, there's matter and there's antimatter, wherever you want to go, philosophical-wise. And I think the Ferrari, in terms of beauty, and the Lamborghini, in terms of being extreme, define the playing field. I don't think you can go more extreme. I don't think you can go much more beautiful in this kind of car class than the Ferrari. Everything else will fall in between. Uh, Robin Koch says, uh, do you have input on the interiors of cars like the new Alpha that are coming to North America? Um, there's a lot of collaboration uh, amongst engineering uh, and powertrain side with, with um, platform strategy, etc. But in terms of styling, whether it's interior or exterior, um, we here in the U.S. do the U.S. portfolio and our colleagues and friends in Turin do the Italian portfolio. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we, we touched on this a little bit, but George from Brooklyn wants to know, what all are you doing for sustainable interior materials? Yeah, so the, the key is, of course, is, uh, is recyclability. Um, and you can do two things. You can either, either use material that then can later be recycled, or you use material that has been recycled in the first place. So, of course, those are topics that need to be addressed, absolutely. HTG asks a good question. He said, I'd like to hear some talk about the potential for weight savings in the interior. How much do those seats weigh, he wonders. Well, the, the seat itself, the leather or the foam is not the issue, but if you want to have eight-way power seats, heated and, and ventilated, and we all enjoy those comforts, uh, that comes with a certain weight because those are uh, motors that drive um, the, 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 the seat. Um, you could save weight if you would the seat only allow go four back and up and down one at a time, but we like to go diagonally up, so it needs two motors driving at the same time. So if you, if you don't want to have the weight, uh, we do offer manual seats, and they just don't have the power, uh, the power motors. So uh, there's the opportunity to choose. M360's got a good question. He says, I'd like to hear what differentiates an interior from a luxury car from the rest of them. He says, uh, some car makers seem to feel all their luxury cars, uh, all that they have to need is leather seating. Uh, and uh, he wants to know what differentiates a, a luxury one. And he goes on to ask, what about switch gear that's not flat, but uh, gives a look and feel that you don't feel elsewhere? Well, it depends what, what the gentleman defines as luxury. I mean, if you want to go all the way up to Rolls-Royce and Bentley, where cars are almost like um, custom-built uh, one by one, um, you can do anything you want. Uh, if you go into mainstream luxury, uh, then it becomes already like part of the uh, company portfolio in terms of uh, what, what components you have. Uh, you see that, you know, in a case in Germany where, where we have a manufacturer that goes all the way from an entry vehicle to super sports cars, and, but you see commonality in, in certain uh, of those gears. Because it takes a lot of um, time and ingenuity and, and testing to get an electronic switch to be perfect. So um, you, you probably won't see us do variations there. And, about, and, and uh, apart from that, I, I sometimes think we miss the topic when we think of what is a luxury and what is not. I don't think the discussion is about luxury or whatnot. It's, it's, these days it's content driven. We expect safety, we expect quality, we expect good design, but what extra content do I get in my interior? Uh, that for me is a more interesting discussion whether something is considered luxury or not. I, I heard a great comment today from a guy, he said, a luxury car is, it's an occasion when you drive it. Yes. Rather than just driving it, you know. Correct. And that, that, and so, but how, how is that occasion, it, it, that means a whole different thing than what it maybe meant 10 or 20 years ago when it was just leather and wood. And, and like when you talk about the interface, look at Tesla, the, the, the Tesla S model where the whole, you know, the interface is all on a giant, a really kind of like a you know a giant LCD screen and that's that's all the controls there so I mean they're doing automakers are experimenting with all kinds of stuff okay we'll veer off uh, uh, here drew uh, chip wants to know about this month's cover feature on Russia's gas motors <laughs> well that, that that was a great story we had our, our uh, editorial director for the uh, uh, wardsauto.com went to Russia and uh, met up with um, uh, Bo Anderson, who's really well known in, in, in uh, uh, the Detroit area. He controlled a $100 billion budget for General Motors and then jumped from the, uh, from the frying pan into the fire in 2009 to uh, get out of GM and then run a, a, a failing Russian automaker. And uh, he's there. He's uh, doing an incredible job turning it around. And uh, now he's becoming more, and now he's going back to making um, uh, cars for Russia. They just got a big uh, contract with General Motors. They're making cars for other people and um, starting to get, after firing something like 50,000 people, um, you know, doing not getting some, fired or right. fired upon himself. Yeah. So, but he just um, done in a, you know, and it's, it's really interesting, I think, for folks in the Detroit area to see this guy, you know, what he's, what uh, this former Swedish army guy did, but he stepped in and, uh, is turning around this this uh, this giant old company and, and making it viable again. It's pretty cool. It is. It is. Uh, 
Okay, back to questions for Klaus. Scott in Cleveland wants to know, is there a Dodge Challenger redesign on the horizon? Uh, you, your viewers should know by now that, I, that you know, we can't talk about future product because we don't want to spoil the surprise, right? So we'll see. We'll see. I'll bet there is. Dr. Nick's got another question here. He says, if you order from the factory, how custom could you make an interior? Could you mix and match across packages? Um, that's a good question. You know, um, I think you can push the envelope a little bit, but, um, but we will try to keep you in, in a sane environment. We, we, because what we do is we have certain exterior colors, certain interior colors, certain finishes, and we would hate to let a car slip out that one individual might like, but everyone else thinks like, oh my God, what did Dodge produce there, right? So we'll, we'll, I think the packages that we have created for people to play with um, are aesthetically approved. And um, you can vary slightly, but not too much. Hey, going back to that one about weight savings, is that something that you get involved in? Is that anything that you are? And, and one of the reasons I ask this is uh, during the AutoLine Supplier Symposium, we had a guy named Jim Kamsikis from, uh, from IAC, the interior supplier. He says, hey, I can pull 30 pounds out of the interior mm -hmm. of a car. Why don't the car companies come ask us for weight reduction? Because he wants to have 300% more money. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that particular case. No, uh, seriously, um, the weight saving uh, is mostly with engineering. But the good thing, uh, I think what makes us strong at Chrysler is there's a strong collaboration between the design office and engineering. So we do work hand in hand and review everything. Uh, is there a smarter solution, whether it's cost or, of course, weight? Um, because um, at the end of the day, it's the overall package that sells, and we try to find uh, every gram that we can to make the car as light and therefore as fuel efficient as possible. You're not to plug our conference too much, but we do have a session on that very topic, and we've got, uh, we've got uh, some folks from Lotus Engineering come in. They've done a lot of research in that area, and a lot of it has to do with parts reduction and, and getting fewer parts means a lighter vehicle, and then, of course, lots of lightweight materials like magnesium and, and uh, um, aluminum and, and, and uh, even some carbon fiber in places. So, but to Klaus's point, you know that all some of it is very expensive, and you got to figure out a way to do it cost effectively. Well, I got one promotion I got to make before we go here. There's a reason why I've got this cardboard box sitting next to me on the chair, and it's because we got another care package from our friends at Katz's Deli in New York, who are big fans of the show. And about once a year, we get this tremendous care package from Katz's Deli, which has been around forever. I mean, it goes back to the, the 19th century that it's been operating there. So I want to tell everybody in the kitchen, everybody at the counters, at Katz's, thank you. We're going to eat good tomorrow. <laughs> They've got the best stuff, and it's so cool when these packages show up. <laughs> Can you share the Chrysler Design Office address with them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should, because I'm telling you, it's killer stuff. Okay. Anyway, uh, Klaus, thanks so much for coming on and Always bringing fun. a Grand Cherokee along with you. Always fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Drew Winter, thanks for joining us Great for this being one. here. Great being here. Yeah, which was just a nice way for you to slide in stuff about yeah. the interior yeah. conference. Well, I can attest it's a great, it's a great conference. Yeah. And Peter, yeah, sure. as always, seeing, good seeing you. And thanks for bringing in this AJ uh, artwork, I guess is what I'd call it. It's more than a picture. Yeah, that's cool. It's a great addition to the studio. Yeah, it works good. I want to thank everybody who has uh, tuned in, and please join us again next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There is all that and much more at autoline.tv.